Good morning, everybody, and Happy New Year to you. I'm going to ask that we all stand and read a verse of Scripture together. It's going to come up on the screen, and let's read it out loud. Full voice, are you ready? It's from Jeremiah 15. Here we go. Your words were found, and I ate them. And your words became for me a joy and the delight of my heart. One more time. Your words were found, and I ate them. And your words became for me a joy and the delight of my heart. Thank you very much. Have a seat. Uh, Years ago, when I was uh, one of about 10 pastors on staff at a large local church, I sat with one of the members uh, in my office who had, this guy kind of had a scowl on his face. We had come in and we were sitting down and, and chatting. And this guy said to me, he said, I think my time here is up and it's time for me to move on. Well, I, I've heard those, those words before from other people over the years. Over 30 years as a pastor, I've heard just about everything. Uh, but this one kind of surprised me a little bit because he'd been a part of our ministry for a pretty long time. So I asked, is there a specific reason why you feel like your time here is up? And he hesitated for just a moment. And then he said, well, I'm just not getting fed. I'm not getting fed. Well, I hate those words. <laughs> <laughs> and not just out of insecurity or anything like that, but because the, the very aim of that church community was designed to alleviate episodes like that. We tried our best to build a culture that, that encouraged and taught self-feeding for every individual because refusing that responsibility opens the floodgate for a kind of spiritual codependency, one that requires others to do for you what you should be doing for yourself. So I challenged this guy with a bit of a word picture. I said, just hang with me for a minute. Imagine this. I said, what if I stumbled into my house one day and Bonnie sees me gaunt and emaciated? No smart aleck comments. Just use your imagination, okay? I'm like 90 pounds. My eyes are sunken into gray sockets. My body is just frail. I can, everybody can see my bones. I'm obviously dying from malnutrition. And when she sees me, she asks, what, what in the world is happening to you? And I just say, I'm not getting fed around here. No one's feeding me. What would her response be? Well, what what any normal person would say, the kitchen is right there. Feed yourself. Feed yourself. That is ridiculous, right? So um, I challenged the guy a bit further. I asked him about time in God's word personally. I said, are you reading the Bible at home? I mean, you have some quiet time alone with God. How is that going? Well, I recognize the look that he gave me. You've heard of the eye of the tiger? This was more the dull stare of the dairy cow. (laughs) Just this blank stare. He had let this life essential somehow drop off of his list of what was important. He still left the church. And I'll, I'll tell you why. Because the illusion of that mindset that he has makes you think that a change in geography will make an internal change as well. It never does. It never does. It happens to all of us, really, Uh, even believers with the best of intentions. It's happened to me. I remember seasons of malnutrition in my own life. And there were those around me that challenged me on these kinds of things. I remember one guy coming up to me and saying, are you depending on once a week feedings on Sunday mornings to sustain you? I mean, someone else shoveling food down your gullet (laughs) said, grow up. You're not a baby anymore, are you? He said, feed yourself, open your Bible daily and feed yourself. If you are starved, listen, if you are, this is what he said, if you're starved, bored, or malnourished, it's your fault, not somebody else's. I was like, well, why don't you tell me what you really feel? (laughs) And my problem was not a lack of resources. My problem was that subconsciously I was expecting other people to spoon feed me to some degree. Not only that, but I was ignoring God's very, very best and most gifted teacher, the Holy Spirit. I mean, God's Spirit is available to me. It's available to all of us to be a a personal counselor and guide through the exploration of His Word. And He invites us to be His students. But so often we live with that dull stare, don't we? Expecting others to do for us what we can only do for ourselves. Take responsibility for our own spiritual health and our own growth and our own nourishment. So um, after I got into the Bible on my own um, and taking responsibility for it, I I remember the words of Psalm 32 really just kind of poking me right in the chest. Um, Here's what it says. 
The Lord says, I will guide you along the best pathway for your life. I will advise you and watch over you. Do not be like a senseless horse or mule that needs a bit and bridle to keep it under control. Well, I had to admit the ugly truth. I was that horse. I was that mule. And it's no fun making that confession. But it was time for me to engage and take responsibility for myself. And that's what we're going to do in 2021. Um, I'm going to teach my way all the way through the Bible, starting on page one. And obviously, you can't through, go through every single verse, or it would be years and years. Uh, but I'm going to go through the mega themes of the Bible and through every book of the Bible. It'll take us through till around the fall, and we'll just kind of see, you know, we'll let it kind of evolve as it goes. But I'm going to teach my way all the way through the Bible in 2021. I mean, who knows what 2021 holds, right? I mean, we certainly didn't see the free-range weirdness of 2020 coming, did we? We did not. I mean, what if 2021 is even weirder? <laughs> weirder, is that even a word? We have an English teacher here. Is that a word? Weird? More weird? What if it's weird to the 10th power? What if 2021 is just weird to the 10th power? We need to be grounded, and there is no better way than to be really anchored in the solid rock foundation of God's eternal and powerful word. Listen to these words. This is what Jesus has to say about that. He says these words in Matthew chapter 7. You've heard these before. I know you have. Everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came down, the streams rose, the winds blew and beat against that house, yet it did not fall because it had its foundation on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on sand. The rain came down, the streams rose, the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell with a great crash, it says. Fell with a great crash. Something falling with a great crash is never good, especially when you're talking about a life. Now, with that in mind, I'm going to give you a couple of statistics, and you're not going to like them. <laughs> about 80% of all that you do, anyone can do. Anyone can do. For example, going to work, attending meetings, checking email, answering phones, going to the kids' soccer games, lunches, dinners, breakfast, what, any stuff. Anybody can do that. Just about anybody can do that. Beyond that, 15%, another 15% of all you do, someone could be trained to do in your place. That's true for all of us, for you or for me. Whether it's doing your work or managing your department or teaching or fixing a broken thing, building something, whatever it may be. With some training, someone else could do it. They could do it. So that's like 95% of your effort and energy right there. But about 5% of what you or I do, only you or I can do. Only I can keep my body healthy. Only I can keep my mind growing. And only I can grow me spiritually. No one else can do that last 5% for me. And I alone am held responsible for it. So only you can feed yourself. No one can do it for you, not even by proxy. You've got to do it. And it's this last 5% that we will be held accountable for in the final analysis. It's that last 5% that determines the depth of influence that we will have upon our world. And that last 5% determines how joyful your life will be. It really does. And one of the most important aspects of this last 5% is this. No one but you must discover and be responsible for this. Your call, your health, your family, your spiritual growth. No one's going to do it for you. I don't know if there's anybody else in your life telling you that. No one's going to do it for you. Now, I know that I will need some help with these things. I'll need some guidance. I'll need some mentoring. Because my big challenge still lies before me, and that's this. Applying what I learn. Because that's a big deal. So I, I want to introduce you to someone who has been given the assignment of securing our foundation in God's Word, if we will allow Him. It's the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit. As a brand new believer, I made a real common error. I expected others to study and prepare well so they could just dump bushels of knowledge into my brain. And I didn't realize that knowledge even Bible knowledge is kind of like sodium in raw form. Sodium can actually be destructive to humans. 
until it gets converted into a higher form, sodium chloride, which is table salt, and in certain measures, it's okay for you. In the same way, knowledge is never an end in itself. It's got to be converted into a higher form, wisdom, for it to really have great benefit in our life. Now, to that end, God gives us the Holy Spirit, who will guide us into all truth. Matter of fact, um, in John 14, Jesus is speaking here, and he says, I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate who will never leave you. He is the Holy Spirit who leads into all truth. The Holy Spirit who leads into all truth. God has, has assigned his Holy Spirit to be our guide, the guide who will develop God's very wisdom into our lives. It's the aim of God's word and his spirit in, at work in us. So how does this work? How does it work? Does the divine mentor just plant information and insight into our subconscious mind while we sleep? Does that happen? Does God build a golden aqueduct between heaven and our mind and just flow wisdoms, you know, raining down upon it? That's not how it works. Not how it works. We receive revelation about God and discover his wonderful promises in one primary place, in his word, in the Bible. The psalmist cries out to the Lord in Psalm 138. Listen to these words. You have exalted above all things, it says, you've exalted above all things your name and your what? Your word, your name and your word. God's word, the Bible, is crucially important to our everyday lives. And don't think obscure religious knowledge. Think food, think water, think air. Now, as a pastor who has worked with people for upwards of 30 years now, let me speak plainly, you won't survive without God's insight and wisdom in your life. Now, we all hear those words. We hear them all the time, and yeah, I know that, Pastor, I know. But here's the truth. I've encountered many people who said they believe that, but lived as though they don't. There's a big difference there, and I've watched their lives implode because of it. We gain wisdom only as our divine mentor instructs us through a living interaction with God's Word. So, not only will we be teaching through the Bible this year, so, and I ask us to apply ourselves the very best that we can to be here or tune in as much as you possibly can, but beyond that, I'm going to ask that you develop or just get a hold of a Bible reading plan for this year. There's so many you can't even count them all. If you go on, lots of us have the Bible app on our phone, the YouVersion Bible app. Um, if you don't have it, get it. There's, there's a multitude of different reading plans that will take you through the Bible in one year. If you're new at this, maybe just do the New Testament through in this year, but do something. Apply yourself and start going in every day or do a five day a week plan, something like that. Patty started uh, one not too long ago called the Daily Audio Bible where it reads, you listen, and you'll go through the Bible in chronological order in the course of a year by just listening. Any of these ways are wonderful ways to get God's Word into you. The Holy Spirit will use all of this to get God's Word into you. Now, our need for a guide like, like this, like the Holy Spirit does for us, it becomes increasingly vital as we get closer and closer to the end of history because this is when spiritual deception is at its highest, the most rampant than ever before. I mean, Paul warned the believers that those that will live in the end times, there would be more false prophets than true ones. And you know as well as I do, there's a lot of nonsense out there, a lot. Without the Holy Spirit, without the guide, we can learn facts all day long and never move one inch closer to the truth that will make a difference in our lives. But with the Spirit, with the Spirit imparting God's wisdom from His Word, the whole picture changes. The wisdom of the ages gradually becomes our own. God sees to it, and God wants that. All right, stay with me for a second. Do you know that top athletes in the world always rely on a coach? And not just in team sports, where there's a coaching staff for the whole team, but especially in these days of individual sports. I mean, virtually every top golfer in the world has a personal coach working with them who keeps an eye on their technique and their posture and their attitudes, all kinds of stuff, personal coaches. Now, I've heard people ask, why do they need a coach? They're the best in the world. That's why they're the best in the world. <laughs> That's the reason for it. They won't become the best nor remain the best at what they do 
until they apply this essential of being coachable. If someone is not coachable, they may have all the talent in the world, they will never ever reach their, their potential. This is equally true for all of us. And God designated some of history's best coaches to us. They can teach us, they can advise us, they can let us learn from their example. It talks about this in God's Word in Hebrews chapter 11. Look what it says in Hebrews 11, 4. By faith, Abel brought a more acceptable offering to God than Cain did. Abel's offering gave evidence that he was a righteous man, and though Abel is long dead, he still speaks to us by his example of faith. He still speaks. Abel still speaks. This man goes all the way back to when you could actually see an angel with flaming swords guarding the entrance to the Garden of Eden. This is a long time ago. This is a guy who called Adam dad and Eve mom. This is the first man ever to die on planet Earth. This guy's so old he had a fax machine. <laughs> But the Bible says this man still has something to say to us today. He's an assigned mentor. So is Noah, Abraham, Jacob, Joseph, Elijah, John, Peter. Likewise, Sarah, Deborah, Ruth, Naomi, Mary, Priscilla, scores of others. These men and women, although they, they no longer maintain an earthly address, they wait to speak to you out of the power of God's word. They're waiting to coach you, to encourage you, to challenge you, correct you, just like a good coach instructs his players. At times, they'll raise their voices because they see you moving towards a dead end. Other times, they'll stand right in your path, blocking your way, just the way that that donkey blocked Balaam's way as he went forward. Now, over a period of about 1,500 years, God used about 40 different people to write down his supernatural words in this divine book, collection of books, really, the Bible. I can't think of a better mentor for a young businessman than Solomon, who reached unbelievable success while he was still a young man. Not to mention, he is seen as the wisest man who ever lived or ever will live. You can learn from the wisest man who ever walked this earth. In the same way, I can't think of a better mentor for a spiritual leader than Moses. I mean, this great leader shepherded a congregation, not of thousands, but of millions. <laughs> millions. We can walk with him through the desert. You can feel the, the heat of the sand between your toes and feel the pressure of leading from the life of Moses. We can learn from Peter, from Paul, from James, the Lord's brother, from Mary, the mother of Jesus from Samuel and David and others, God has given these men and women the assignment to coach his children in every facet of life. They're available to us. They live in God's word to help us. God's word says, all these have gone before us. He uses the, They've gone before us. And now they're in the grandstands, cheering us on, waiting to coach us. All we have to do is ask and believe. Now, there are two basic kinds of coaches that you'll find in the Bible. Most of them, like Abraham and Daniel and James, are godly mentors. They show us how to live our lives wisely, even though they're not perfect. They show us how to live our lives wisely and how to walk God's path as best we can, as God gives us strength. But, but, the Bible also gives us examples of foolish, even evil living, to teach us how not to live. So God includes the stories of Cain and Esau and Ahab, Jezebel and Herod and Judas, allowing their voices to live on so we don't make the same mistakes and destructive choices that they made. They speak to us from the downside of poor decisions. And Solomon reminds us of this in the uh, book of Proverbs chapter 24. Look at these words. The writer says, I went past the field of a sluggard past the vineyard of someone who has no sense. Thorns had come up everywhere, the ground was covered with weeds, and the stone wall was in ruins. I learned a lesson from what I saw, a little more sleep, a little more slumber, and poverty will come on you like a thief. Now, you see that example, and you learn from it. I don't wanna be known as a sluggard, someone who has no sense, 
In modern terms, I don't want to be a doofus and neither do you. Now, a, a while back, I remember talking to a guy who had been away at Bible school for a couple of years and he had returned and I was talking to him. And I, I asked him, I said, how were your classes? And he said, uh, some of them were awesome. Some were a total waste. I said, really, what do you mean? He said, some of the, the instructors were really, really good, but the rest were awful. He said, I didn't learn anything from them. Well, I decided to challenge him a little bit. And I said, you know, you can learn as much from the bad as from the good. He said, no, you don't get it. You don't understand. Some of them are so bad, we were bored stiff within five minutes. I said, that's an incredible opportunity. <laughs> he said, what? I said, you can learn amazing things from that experience. So, I mean, take notes on it. Look back on, take notes on it. Like, Professor A was able to bore us to sleep within five minutes. Somehow he has taken the most exciting book in the world and bored people to tears with it, and that's a miracle. But I said, then analyze what he did. What made it so boring? What was it? Was it his monotone voice, his lack of preparation? They have no passion for the subject. If you can figure out how to learn from the bad as well as from the good, then you'll learn twice as much. Dull stare of the dairy cow. <laughs> but that's true for all of us. That's why God put in the Bible these raw, unedited accounts of men and women behaving both wisely and foolishly. He handpicked these people to mentor us, the good and the bad, together. And the lessons will come from every angle. So get ready. The best gems might come from unexpected places. And if you'll go there, those treasures will belong to you. You have a divine inheritance waiting in the pages of Scripture. So don't you want to go after it? Go get it? We can let these Bible writers influence our lives right here and now, thousands of years later. Their voices continue echoing down the hallways of our lives. And after thousands of years, not one thing has been lost. Their words are as alive today and as powerful today as the day they were first uttered. So they're captured in kind of a time warp. These coaches share potent lessons of wisdom, awaiting discovery. So the prophets still speak. The coaches still instruct. The Holy Spirit is still waiting to mentor you. God uses the character of his word to inspire us through their success and disciple us through their scars. So we're going to walk alongside their rough, unedited lives with eyes wide open. So I'm inviting all of us in 2021. We're going to jump into this experience of absorbing the Bible, absorbing God's word, and becoming better for it. We'll allow ourselves to be coached into experiencing God's very, very best for our lives. Now, as we wrap up, I want to take us right back to the very beginning, right where we started, and I'm going to read this verse from Jeremiah again. Your words were found, and I ate them, and your words became for me a joy and the delight of my heart. I want you to bow your heads and we'll pray. Lord, uh, it is quite possible that lots of, us, lots of us have never even considered opening up the Bible as eating finding your words and eating them and allowing them to become for me a joy and the delight of my heart. But God, I believe that's exactly what will happen when we access your word with great intent to absorb it, to read it, to understand it, and apply it. Lord, I believe your words will become a delight to our heart. And God, you will be honored and glorified through our lives as we begin to take in your word and live it out. And Lord, we ask right now for your help. Lots of us have struck out before with the best of intentions and come the third week of January, we're done, we're lost. But God, I pray that you would help us walk through your word with the intent of absorbing it and living it and that your blessing would be upon it. We need you, Lord. And we believe that you'll help us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.